And thanks very much indeed for inviting me here, Milton. Um, and I'm very aware that I'm not only the last speaker at a conference, but also between you guys and lunch. So uh, I'll try and uh, be reasonably efficient with my time. Um, the, uh, it's been fascinating, and I want to congratulate uh, Milton and the team on the, the topic here, the happy doctors component of the, uh, the conference, because quite a few people this morning have mentioned the issue of provider uh, satisfaction, provider health. And that's what I'm going to be talking about now. So I'm known in these circles mainly for my sort of telemedicine background and uh, writing about telepsychiatry. And I've been fortunate in having two books written and published by the American Psychiatric Association this year. The first is on telepsychiatry, but the second is on my other sort of clinical interest, which is physician health. Um, and both of these books, uh, incidentally, if you want them, they're available on Amazon. Um, but uh, both of these books are basically the core of what I'm going to talk to you about now. Um, and uh, it's not immediately obvious, but there's a lot, actually a lot of overlap in the two topics. And, in fact, and several speakers this morning mentioned uh, that sort of overlap, but I want to take it really to the next stage. Um, so the, the telepsychiatry book um, has a lot about how to practice efficiently. What are the good media skills you can use? How do you manage uh, working on email? What's, what's the process of being a 24 by 7 by 365 day doc um, available to your patients all the time? How can you set up rules and control your practice and manage your life so that you remain healthy? Um, the, the physician suicide book um, is really a case-based textbook. And one of the cases, in fact, uh, on, on chronic alcohol abuse, which is a common problem for physicians, uh, features a physician who uh, ultimately is treated by telemedicine for many years um, by his original treating uh, addiction team. Um, and so I think you can see there's all sorts of overlaps between, in fact, technology and physician health. And my thesis to you today is that if we can um, focus more on how we intelligently use technology, that we actually can use this as a way of improving our own health care. So the main objective of this is just to look at um, clinician burnout and, and, and other uh, issues and how can we uh, best uh, improve that using, using technologies. Now let me ask you all a quick question. Uh, how many of you in the audience are providers of some description? Okay. Um, so how many of you know, uh, know of or know uh, either a physician or a medical student who has suicided? Okay, look around, okay? Um, the, and I ask that at every conference I go to, and there's always about at least 20% of the, of the group here. If I go to a physician-only conference, it's typically about 80 or 90% of people who put up their hands as knowing a colleague or a friend or someone they've worked with uh, who's, who's suicided at some stage during their career. And this is a big secret among physicians. It's kept very quiet. Um, the reality is, in this country, over 400 physicians suicide every single year. Um, so that's the equivalent of two large medical school classes uh, dying by suicide, often at the peak of their careers, not, not necessarily waiting till they're later. Um, the, the, the particularly tragic component about this is that, in fact, female physicians suicide just as commonly as males. And so female physicians actually can't suicide twice as commonly as their equivalent females in the non-physician population. And male physicians suicide about 1.4 times as commonly. Um, so whilst you're being looked after by your doctor, your doctor is sig at significantly increased risk of, of committing suicide than you are, which is really amazingly ironic when you think about it. Um, we know that burnout is very highly prevalent among physicians. Um, and we know very importantly that 80% at least of the sort of symptoms of burnout are related to organizational and systems issues, okay? You can't resilience yourself out of burnout, okay? You can't just go and take up yoga and suddenly be totally fine. It's, it's a helpful thing to do but it's not the ultimate actual treatment, okay? So we have to look at how we change the way we work and how we change our systems and our organizational processes, and that is going to be a much more effective way of helping uh, physicians and other providers. So I'm one of the people who uh, emphasizes uh, looking at adding an extra goal to um, our sort of national health uh, directions. We all know about improved patient care, lower costs and better outcomes. I think we should have increased clinician wellness 
as actually one of our national goals, and that anyone doing research in healthcare looking at health outcomes should start looking at clinician outcomes as part of the actual overall uh, emphasis of whatever studies they're doing. This is becoming a bit more popular. Uh, people have sort of worked it out. It's a fairly hot area in some respects, and as, as other people have said, there's all sorts of health systems are, are creating chief wellness officers. UC, UC Davis is actually going through that process right now. Um, uh, there's a number of other articles that you can find around this. Um, very briefly, um, burnout itself, a uh, very common syndrome. It's not a formal psychiatric illness, but it undoubtedly leads to other disorders. Um, but essentially three sets of symptoms. So emotional depletion, where you just feel exhausted and very tired. A, a, a sense of detachment and cynicism, where you tend to think of patients as being numbers rather than people. Um, uh, and then a sense of low personal achievement. What, it's not worth it, it's, it's, uh, life is no good for me. Um, and, and burnout we know is associated with, uh, oh, and, and so who gets burnout? Um, this is um, very, very nice research from Tate Shanafelt and his team. But basically, if you look on the top, the, if, you, if you look at the top left, that's where you want to be as a physician, okay? You want to have a good work-life balance and relatively little burnout. Bottom right is where you don't want to be because there you've got high burnout and a poor work-life balance. Now, if you look at the bottom right, um, which of the physicians are most, most at risk, um, the, the urologists come out as being far the worst. Um, but really importantly, the primary care specialties are in that box for the, for the most part. Um, the people up in the, in the left top box are, are actually psychiatry and preventive medicine and a, and a few other groups like that. Now, the physicians that kill themselves the most are actually very interesting. The emergency medicine people actually kill themselves the most, along with anesthesiologists. So the emergency medicine people actually here, if you look at them, they're way out on the, the top right. Um, so they're highly burned out, but they have a, a good work-life balance. So they're just constantly running all the time. And that actually, if any of you are emergency medicine physicians, that's actually pretty much a stereotype. Um, anesthesiologists are very much in the middle. And, and the reason that they kill themselves so frequently is because they have such good access to effective drugs. Um, we know that burnout is driven by high workloads, by workflow inefficiencies, and by documentation. Several people have mentioned the EHR, um, uh, and, and that leads to a whole lot of symptoms. Now, at an individual level, we know that burnout leads to relationship problems, alcohol abuse, depression, and, and suicide, in, uh, unfortunately, in too many cases. But at a systemic or an organizational level, uh, burnout, as you can see, also leads to decreased quality care and more uh, errors with patients. So this is a patient safety issue, a very important patient safety issue that many health systems are now recognizing. Um, decreased patient satisfaction, decreased productivity, uh, and very importantly, increased physician turnover. So people lose their, change their jobs when they're, when they're burnt out as a way of solving their burnout problem. Um, uh, Stanford's done some very nice work looking at what should a good health system look like. And again, the reason for focusing on this in a technology-focused conference like this is because efficiency of practice is one of the core issues. And that means using technology to make yourself uh, more efficient, but also um, more capable. I'm going to briefly mention the EMR just because several other people have mentioned it. Um, um, there's no question that it causes a lot of burnout, absolutely no doubt about that. There's been study after study has shown that and that it reduces uh, the time that we have with patients um, uh, quite markedly in many cases and that uh, it interrupts the clinical interview. M most of the EMRs are badly designed, badly made. They're created by engineers typically who in the past didn't really understand the sort of medical workflow so well. Um, uh, the reality is it is possible to get over the EMR, all right? Um, uh, there are a whole lot of techniques that are being used, everything from, uh, you know, using multiple templates, dictation systems, scribes, you know, the, the Google scribes as well. Um, but very importantly, one of, the most, one of the best techniques for solving the EMR problem is actually to see your patients on video. Uh, when I see my patients on video, I type at the same time. 
I do all my notes as I'm seeing the patient, which as a psychiatrist is a bit unusual. Um, but it's actually socially appropriate because the patients can't see you typing. Um, I use a soft keyboard um, and I actually get my notes completed much more efficiently when I see patients on video. So I actually have more time with patients on video um, than I do in person. I think that's, and that is very satisfying. And that is something that you find that telepsychiatrists in particular constantly comment on. But they actually like spending that extra time with their patients. And it's because we're actually not held up by the EMR to the same extent. Um, so there was a lot of mention of hybrid care from the, uh, the, the, the San Francisco group this morning, and, the, uh, and I was very, very impressed by that. I, mean, I think that's the way most physicians will be working in the future. Uh, they'll be seeing patients both in a virtual environment and in person. Uh, that's the way that I've been working for quite a number of years now. Um, it actually makes you, it's a much more interesting way of working, um, uh, and, and it gives you more time with patients, as, as I said previously. Um, I'm not going to talk about it in great detail, um, but there's a lot being written about it, and, and there's a whole chapter, in fact, in the telepsychiatry book on hybrid care. Now, this is my office at UC Davis. It's a typical, uh, sort of slightly untidy academic office, um, but you'll see, on, but it's set up for patients to be seen both in person and online. So you can see the typical chairs there for, for patients when they come in, um, but, I, but I also have three screens. And I typically have three screens, one for video, one for the EMR, and one for any sort of messaging or email or, you know, just getting on the internet. Um, I hasten, this is not a patient you're seeing here, it's a staff member. Um, uh, but so I'm set up like that so that I can work in a hybrid way. And so that literally any patient who comes now to UC Davis who wishes to come to the clinic that I work in gets the offer of being seen either in person or on video. And a lot of patients choose to, you know, do both and sometimes come in and see us, sometimes come in video. So the same model that was being talked about earlier on this morning, and it is, quite honestly, a much nicer way of working. Um, I spent a very good, interesting session seeing one of my physician patients yesterday who was actually at the gym. And she'd just finished her session. She went off into a quiet room. Uh, we had our session, and then she went back to the gym. Um, and, uh, and I think that's actually, it shows you much more about people's lives when you start working like that. They don't have to come to you all the time. Um, so this is the other reason I like it. This is our second home down in, uh, in the Monterey area. And I now spend one day a week working at home. Uh, uh, so as an academic, I can do that. But I do everything at home that I do at work uh, except physically in-person consults. And so I have multiple meetings on video, do all sorts of other electronic things. And quite honestly, I love working at home. It's much more, it, it's much more fun. Uh, I can have lunch with my wife. I can have a coffee. I typically have my dog sitting around my feet while I'm seeing patients. Um, it's genuinely much more relaxing and much, more, much easier to see patients like that. So what are the, let's look briefly to finish up the actual advantages of telemedicine, because this needs to be researched a lot more, OK? Um, we know that the quality in most disciplines is as good as in person, okay? And I say that the actual evidence for what I'm about to say now actually comes a lot of it from the intensive care area, uh, from, from Visicu and companies like that and providing uh, services into intensive cares. Psychiatry has also provided quite a lot of the evidence to support these statements. But we know the quality is about as good. We know on the whole that you actually have more time with patients, as I explained earlier on. That's, that's true across many different disciplines. We know that you have more flexibility, independence, and control. You can choose your own hours. You don't have to work nine to five anymore. Young women in particular who have families love this because they can be at home with their kids. Um, we know it is cheaper. Uh, we are, my, the clinic I'm in loves it when I see lots of telepsychiatry patients because there's no admin costs associated with them. The patients don't come in. The clinic actually works faster and smoother. Um, you can have more variety, so you can set up your own specialist systems and start seeing the types of patients you want to see. Clearly, you can work with teams. With, uh, I've worked with Indian Health Services on reservations for many years now. Um, and then there's a safety issue, particularly if you happen to work in corrections, if you're female, if you've got aggressive patients, um, and, and, and issues like that. Now, these are all the sort of the obvious advantages of, of telemedicine across multiple disciplines. Um, the other one that I think is really important is, is the other AI. We all think of AI as being artificial intelligence. 
I think of it as being augmented information. So it actually follows on from the talk on decision support that was given earlier on this morning. Because as physicians, we're going to be increasingly using virtual care and other approaches to provide more information for us on the fly as we're seeing patients. And you can see here a whole list of technologies that are coming through, that are going to be used over the next few years, and that will be integrated into our normal practice. And my suggestion to you is be active and use as many of these technologies as you can. So to finish up, think about the quadruple aim, think about clinician wellness, put outcomes regarding your provider health into any research studies or papers you're doing or writing, uh, and uh, have fun. Thank you. <laughs> oh, so good. Thank you so much for the talk. I guess we have Kara. Thank you for so much for the, um, all your points about clinician wellness. And one of the things that uh, physicians face is recredentialing. And, you know, for each hospital, it's usually every two years. And you have to disclose all of your healthcare information. And so, so many, this is such a, a difficult thing to do when there's stigma attached to any mental health care or other numerous things. I just wondered if you have some comments for a solution. I wondered, so, you know, I've had colleagues rest over this and you had a, a, a personal friend who took his own life um, because he just couldn't face um, not being able to practice. Yeah, no, I mean, there is no doubt that some of the credentialing and, and equally some of the medical board uh, licensing uh, documents can be, you know, I think absurd. Uh, I have to say what I normally say to people is if you get a asked a question like that, unless you've actually been impaired, you know, if, I think if you're impaired from practice then you have to you know, tell the truth, okay? I don't think you can get away from that as a professional. I just tell people to, to say no. Um, because uh, if you've had depression or anxiety or PTSD and, and you've carried on working and you've had treatment, I mean, what's the difference between breaking that and breaking a leg? I mean, and so, um, you know, I, I have to say, I, I tell people very actively um, to, to only admit to those things if you've actually been impaired. And, and I, but I do think if you've been impaired, then that is an issue, and you need to, it needs to be sorted out, and, and, you know, you need to be honest about that. Hi, Dr. Yellenis, again, thank you for your talk and sharing your personal experience with how it's just enriched your life working in this hybrid right. mod model. Um, just going back to how you started with um, burnout, and I've read various things about burnout in physicians and, and depression. I'm just wondering, in, uh, with your experience, do you feel that there's an overlap, or is burnout also a diagnosable depression, in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I'm fairly cynical about the burnout literature, to be honest. Um, you know, there's been several big studies showing that at any one time, up to 50% of physicians have one of those three sets of symptoms. But they're very broad symptoms. Um, and, you know, my personal view is probably if you actually look at sort of almost real burnout that's having a significant impact on people, you're probably talking about 15 or 20%. Um, but that's still a very high rate. Um, uh, now, I think there's no doubt it's a sort of vulnerability marker for developing other psychiatric disorders. And that's the way I think of it. So I think if you, if you are very burnt out, um, then, you know, clearly, uh, you know, you're more likely to get depressed, anxious, go drinking, whatever, okay? Um, and I see it as a vulnerability marker. I don't see it as a formal psychiatric illness. It may be in the future, you never know. I mean, sex addiction's just been declared an illness. Um, so you never know. But I, I suspect that's going to take a long time. Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, more of a logistic question. If you have a new patient, um, is there already a, doc a legal doctor-patient relationship um, through video call? If I'm seeing a new patient? Yeah, first time. Not before I see them, no. Um, so I, when I'm working with Indian Health, I, I literally never meet the patients in person. I, I, I work on six different reservations around the state. I've seen hundreds and hundreds of patients over the years. 
uh, on the reservations, literally have never met one physically. And, but I certainly have a doctor-patient relationship with all the ones I've seen, but not before I see them. Okay. And for patients who have, are given the choice to see, be seen in person or through the video call, um, is there any, uh, do, do they, do you, is the first encounter, is it uh, better if you've seen them in person in advance first or not? Yeah, I, I mean, look, w the majority of the patients in the clinic I work in get seen in person the first time, but that's because it's a training clinic and we have a lot of residents around, okay? I've seen hundreds or well, thousands of patients um, purely on video. Um, without ever seeing them in person. I don't think you need to see but someone in person to have a relationship. Uh, I mean, just look at the number of people who get married. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, the other group that has always been really good, and, and the, other, the other reason why I'm, I also talk, I talk about the, the relationship online. I mean, there's no doubt you can have a more intimate relationship by video than you can in person. And particularly if it's about a stigmatized topic, such as maybe sexual abuse or HIV or, or domestic violence, something like that. Um, because there's a little bit of extra distance, and the patient, if the patient, say, is a female and they're coming to see me as a male, they're going to be less anxious and less threatened if there's that extra distance of a video between them and me. And so I commonly have much more intimate conversations on video that, with patients than I would in person. I've had numerous patients who've been seeing me in person a few times, and then they switch to video, and they'll suddenly start telling me all this other stuff they never used to tell me in person. Um, so there's a really interesting intimacy issue on, online. Any other questions? Maybe the final question as we close out the conference. Okay. And thank you so much, by the way. Good. For, uh,